All right, so I started a series last week, and you might say it's a continuance. I preached the, the one sermon, A Champion for Christ, and we talked about a champion for Christ. First off, they knew that they were saved. The Bible says we can know. These things have I written unto you who believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe. So not only does it teach security, but it teach a continuant, teaches a continuance or a patient uh, uh, living for Christ come what may. And uh, I started to call it heroes and heroines of the, uh, the faith, but, you know, heroine, I guess, is one of those words like gay that the lost world has taken from us kendra i think when i say heroin most of us do not think of a lady who has done some great thing but we think of heroin the drug so i decided that i would just go with champions for christ and then i don't have to try to pronounce heroin right every week because i never feel like i say that word exactly right and i don't have to worry about anybody thinking i'm talking about a drug so today we are talking about jail, uh, and I'm not saying, you should have seen, I, I gave a, a, what you might say, uh, a shortened version of this to the softball team the other day, and when I said, I want to talk to you about jail, you should have seen a lot of those girls, boy, their eyes got real big, and I'm like, not J-A-I-L, but J-A-E-L, she's found in Judges chapter 4, if you want to turn there, but... Um, <clears throat> jail we could call her a minute woman for the master because just in a second's notice she did something that changed the course of history uh, we could say that uh, there are two gallant girls and two gutless guys in this text and uh, I don't think it's God's plan for for us to men for we men to be gutless but when we are and God has something he wants done he will bring it to pass okay so we see two gutless guys, and we see two gallant girls here. And I, I would like to read you the better part of Judges chapter 4, um, and then I'll try to give you some, some particular information uh, and then give you something that we can get from you. When I read it, you might think, well, how are we going to apply that to our daily life? None of us put up tents. Uh, I don't think any of us are going to be called upon to nail someone's head to the ground with a tent stake, but I still think there's something that we can learn here. So let's read starting in, in uh, Judges chapter 4 and verse number 1. The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jaban, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera. Okay, that means he was the general of Jaban's army. Jaban's a little king, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. In 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. So this is what happened to the children of Israel over and over in the Old Testament. And I think most of us Christians can see how this happens to us. First, we, are, we get saved. And we are thoroughly right with God. And so we are on fire. Uh, I, I had the children read something from Mississippi uh, writers this last week at Nettleton. And a girl was describing Sundays. And she talked about a newly converted brethren. Uh, and she gave his name who was, even though the sermon was 45 minutes longer than what they were used to, he continued to say, amen, brother, amen, preach it, brother, etc." cetera. Uh, and... <clears throat> We've all been there where we're just on fire for the Lord, as it were. And then we kind of get comfortable in our walk. And when we get comfortable, then we kind of quit taking in the daily word and, and maybe we don't talk to the Lord like we should. And then we kind of start to back up a little bit. And then before we know it, we are in bondage to some sin or another. And, and we cry out for God to help us. And then we get right with God again. And for the Israelites, it was periods of, of 10, 20, sometimes 80 years, Christy, that circle took place. They might be in bondage 80 years before they had, that's two generations, right, at least, before they had the courage to, or the gumption, uh, right, the sensibility to call out to God for help. So they've been in bondage. Uh, some people say a generation is 40 years, 20 years. They've been in bondage a while, uh, maybe a generation, maybe half a generation. They call out to God for help, and they're worried, <coughs> excuse me, 
because Sisera's got, what did he say, 900 chariots, and he had oppressed them for 20 years. And Deborah, a prophetess, now I don't think it's God's plan for women to, to, to be the, the preachers. That's basically what a prophetess is. But it's like Brother Jerry told me, some old preacher, and he could probably tell us now what preacher it was, but some preacher told him that if it weren't for the faithful ladies, he wouldn't have had anybody in the congregation to call on to pray because none of the men were faithful to come to church. So here we got none of the men are where they can hear from God, but this lady, Deborah, she's, she's in touch with God. She, she's in, and so she's telling the men what God says needs to take place. Let's look here. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, uh, she judged Israel at that time, and she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment, and she sent and called Barak, okay, and the son of Amin, Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward the mount of Tabor, Tabor, <clears throat> and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun, and I will draw unto thee to the river, I will draw unto thee to the river of Kishon Sisera the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. So here, God tells the girl to tell the guy that God said, go forth to war, and I'm going to deliver the enemy into your hand. And look at the gutless guy's response, Michael. God has a woman tell him, you need to go forth into battle. I'm going to give you the victory. But look what the guy says. Yes, sir. Well, yes, he asked Deborah to come with him, but you stole my thunder. Thank you. All right, look here in verse number 8. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. Oh, what can This guy's supposed to be leading the army, and he tells the woman, It ain't even his wife, Jerry. I can understand. I have said I would go to any nation, any station, one stipulation that Denise is with me. He didn't say for Denise to go. He didn't say for his wife to go. He said for Lapidoth or whatever the man's name was. For his wife, if she'll go with me, I'll go forth in the battle. Honestly, we could call him gutless, and I think it is kind of gutless, but <coughs> at least he wants this person who he knows is in touch with God to go with him. But look at her response. She said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. And <coughs> when we first read that, we're thinking that, okay, you won't go if I don't go, so really I'm effectively the leader. And so maybe we think she's talking about herself. And she may have thought she was talking about herself. The Bible's unclear to us on this, Chris. But I, she's really talking about jail. We'll see that as we read on. Let's continue. <clears throat> Verse 10, and Barak called Zebulon and Naphtali to Cape Kedesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber, now Heber is the man's name. Heber is a Kenite. Heber means friend. This is the same root word we get the word Hebrews from because Abraham was called what? The friend of God, okay? Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. Now what do we typically know Moses' father-in-law as? In other places he is called Jethro, and he is called a priest of the Midianites. So based on what I read right here, I believe the Midianites and the Kenites are the same people, just different names. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself <coughs> from the Kenites and pitched his tent unto the plain of Zanim. Y'all can say it how you want to. Which is by Kedesh. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoab was gone up to the Mount of Tabor, and Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Herosheth of the Gentiles unto the river Kishon. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up for this day, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down to the Mount of Tabor, and 10,000 men after him, and the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak. 
so that Sisera lighted off his chariot and fled away. Here is your second gutless guy. He's the general. What's the general supposed to do? Is he supposed to run off and hide, or is he supposed to go down with it? Think of it in the, in the sense of a ship. You know, <clears throat> when a ship goes down, who's supposed to go down with the ship? The captain. So here's the captain of the host, but he's slipping off the back way and running off on foot trying to hide like he he's not the leader because they might let a peon go, Chris. They might let a pawn go. They might let a private go, but the general, they're going to kill him. So he slips out the back door, as it were. And Bayrock, But Bayrock pursued after the chariots and after the host. See, so the chariots went that way. Sisera went that way. <coughs> Unto Herosheth of the Gentiles, and all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. So the Israelites killed everybody except Sisera. Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was a peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, and fear not. And when he had turned in, turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him again. And covered him, excuse me. Again, he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, Is there a man here? Thou shalt say, No. So here we see again, we see the gutless guy. He's wanting somebody else's wife to protect him. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a an hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. And so he died. <clears throat> I'll try to give you a little background. And then... I I promise you, I believe the Lord has shown me some stuff that we can learn from this. Again, Kenite, Medianite are the same people. Moses, father-in-law, was a priest. Basically, the God of the Kenites was Yahweh. <laughs> Yahweh is Jehovah. That's the same God the Israelites worship. So there was a peace between the Kenites and Jaban's army but yet there's this long relationship between the Israelites and the Kenites. Kenite means a descendant of Cain, all right? But the similarity is both the Kenites and the Israelites worshipped Jehovah. So <clears throat> sometime before Jethro, at least the larger portion of the Kenites worshipped Jehovah. They traditionally dwelt with the Amalekites, and so they traveled around. Who were the Amalekites? They were descendants of Esau. So these descendants of Cain and descendants of Esau basically were no bads and moved around together. All right? The Kenites are mentioned in Genesis 15, where the Lord promises to give Abraham the promised land. <coughs> and yet we see in 1 Samuel 15, Saul gives the Kenites a warning and said, Hey, God said destroy the Amalekites. And you're living over there with the Amalekites. So if you don't want to receive the justice of God, you need to get on up out of there. That's obviously Hallman's paraphrase, not the exact words of Scripture. But David in 1 Chronicles chapter 2 showed them kindness because he sent them gifts. And he said that he couldn't forget the kindness their fathers had shown unto the Israelites when the Israelites were in the wilderness. So they were some of the only people that had shown kindness to the Israelites. And since Moses' father-in-law was a prophet of Je a priest of Jehovah, a priest of the Midianites, worshiping Jehovah. That seems to me the only reason they would have shown kindness because they worshiped the same God. These were a nomadic people, but with the exception of Judges 6 and 7, they seem to always be on the side of the Israelites, Okay. I've already told you God told Barak to go out there and defeat those people because his people were calling on him to defeat Jaban's army, but he wouldn't go without Deborah. And then God didn't even give the victory through Deborah. He gave it through, the, through this little old housewife. Now, 
I'm sure Miss Janice keeps a nice house. I'm sure Christy and Kendra and Kayla and Miss Karen, and I know my wife keeps a nice house. But I don't know that it's the same as having to put up and take down a tent. I don't know what the men were doing, but history shows that for these nomadic peoples like the Kenites, the men did what the men did, but the women folks put up and took down these tents over and over. So how many hundreds of times has she done this drudgery of driving a tent stake, in, a tent stake into the ground? So this person comes in, and he's wanting her... He's here, the second gutless guy. He turns into her, and he wants her to take care of him. She does. She makes him a nice bed. She covers him up. He comes out the covers. Hey, I want something to drink. She gives him some milk. Everybody's tired when they've worked hard all day. And if you think about it in a, in a battle, the closest thing to a battle most of us know would be like a football game, and you've worked hard in this football game, and you're really tired. But if you worked hard and you lost, then you're even doubly tired, right? Or if it's an actual war battle and you survived the battle, but your side lost the battle, you're tired either way. There's been a battle, but now you're doubly tired, okay? So he's sound asleep. So she sneaked in, which is what Webster says the proper past tense of sneak is, sneaked. Or as we say down south, she snuck in. And just one failed swoop, she dropped it. There goes the film. Amen. She drove that spike through his head <clears throat> and killed him. So what can we get from this? I think Denise and I understand something about nomadic life because we have lived in 20 homes and coming up on 19 years. And yet, that's not the same. We wouldn't be considered nomads because we've actually lived in a home, and as my cousins from Alabama would say, without wheels. We actually have a foundation that our home is set on, okay? Uh, so we wouldn't be considered nomads. But what we have noticed in, we were cleaning out something the other day, and moving ever so often has its benefits. This is a rabbit trail. has absolutely nothing to do with the ser sermon but you, when you stay in one place a long time, you gather up stuff that you don't use. And you just keep it because you don't come across it. <clears throat> when moving, we throw away or sell a bunch of stuff because, well, we hadn't used that in over a year. Must not need it. Boom, we get rid of it. Boom, we get rid of it. But you stay someplace. Okay, that has nothing to do with the sermon. But look, this was just a housewife. So in the grand scheme of things, I'm sure Heber thought she was the best thing since sliced bread, but in the grand scheme of things, she's just an ordinary person. But look how God used this ordinary person to change the course of history and to fulfill the prophecy that the enemy would be delivered into the hand of a woman. So what can we get from this? I say first and foremost, we need to give attention to readiness. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul tells Timothy, be instant, in season, out of season, okay? In Nehemiah chapter 4, the Bible says that the men worked with a trial in one hand and a weapon in the other. I say this applies to us all because we all need to be ready at all times for God to use us. God can use ordinary people in extraordinary ways. God can use ordinary folks to change the course of history. <coughs> Number two. We need to give all effort to the task at hand. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9.10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Don't go about it halfway. 1 Corinthians 10.31, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. We need to put, give, get all our effort to it because God can use anybody, and he wants to. She killed this one man. This whole story is reminiscent to me of the story of Alvin York from World War I. Alvin York was pinned down with a group of men, and it's my understanding only four or five of his unit survived. All the officers were shot, so he, as sergeant, became the leader, and he went. This man who at the beginning was a conscientious objector, but people took the Bible and explained to him that God does use war. So this conscientious objector became a Medal of Honor recipient. And the, after 
before he got the Medal of Honor, but after this battle, this battle where he and three or four others took out more than one machine gun nest and captured over a hundred of the enemy, four people captured like 132 or 134 Germans. And his response when the general asked him, well, what his motivation was, and he said, by, by taking their life, yes, I took a man's life, but by taking that man's life behind that machine gun, more than taking his life, I was saving the lives of any man coming behind me. And so, yes, she took a man's life, but in, in taking that man's life, she protected God's people, okay? We need to give all of our effort to that, to, to anything God lays in our paths to do. Give all attention to readiness. Give all the effort to what we do. And look, they were kind of the servants of the Israelites because they were not God's chosen people, okay? And yet they worshiped God. So we could say, we could take this, and we've been going through the prison epistles, and we could turn to Colossians chapter 3 or Ephesians chapter 5, but we just finished more than 20 sermons going through the prison epistles. So let me just bring it to to your memory, don't give eye service to the employers. We sh could look specifically at these places, but one thing is said over and over, the servant or the slave was to honor his master as if he were the master, and that's what we need to do. So how does this apply to us? All of these things work in con giving attention to readiness, giving all effort to the task at hand, even when nobody's looking, works together in concert to spread the gospel in word and deed. Those two words I used together a lot, Brother Jerry, because Christ used them. The Bible says, uh, on, I think it's Luke 24, when he's walking on the Emmaus Road, and these two disciples he's talking to, which are probably a husband and a wife, they don't realize that he's actually the risen Christ, but he begins to <coughs> talk about what Christ did, and explain them the truth, he says, in word and deed. We see that same terminology in Romans 15, Colossians 3, and 1 John chapter 3. Word and deed means we have to give utterance to it, but our conduct should give believability to the word. So how do we work these things together? The Lord uses us mightily when we give attention to be ready at all times to love our family, our friends, and even our enemies. I'm not talking about just mouthing the words, I love you. I'm talking about that Ephesians 5 love for your wife where you lay down your life for her. I'm talking about that Deuteronomy 6 where you use every available moment to teach your children the things of God. I'm talking about giving attention to be ready at all times to witness to Christ by, of Christ by word and deed and to, be a, to give appropriate service to our employers. The Lord's glorified when we give all effort to not only being ready to love our wife, kids, family, friends, enemies, but to actually do it. To give all effort to more than being ready to give a witness, but to actually give a prayer for witness. To give attention to more than being ready to serve our employers, but to actually serve our employers. All these things go directly against our culture. I got a little rhyme. Wives leave husbands at the drop of a hat. Husbands leave wives. For less than that. Parents neglect children because they don't truly care. And children dishonor parents because the parents aren't truly there. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And I could preach this chapter to you, but I'm just going to read you about 10, 10 or 11 verses. I'll put on my glasses to make it a little easier. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile. Guile is when you don't truly lie, but you use the truth in an untruthful manner. Hypocrisies, envies, and all evil speaking as newborn babes. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones built up 
a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, that's talking about Christ, and he that believeth on him should not be confounded. <coughs> unto you therefore which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same has become the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Wherefore unto also they were appointed. That's where people get the whole Calvinism thing. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Look at here. A peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, in other words, as foreigners and travelers, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your compensation, that's your lifestyle, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, do, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of his visitation. Our lives are important besides just when we're inside the four walls of this church. In Jael's day, the average Israelite was not truly worshiping Jehovah. According to Judges 6 and 7, it appears to me that the Kenites were not always truly worshiping Jehovah. And we could sit around and we could point to all the things in our society which prove that our society is not truly worshiping the God of the Bible. But I don't think that's what God wants us to do. We need to discern those things true enough. But I think sometimes when we talk about society, we began to sit on our hands and say, well, God can't do a work. And, and there's some truth in that, Brother Jerry. The Bible says that he didn't do great works in Galilee because of the unbelief. But in the words of Mark, he couldn't do great works in Galilee because of their unbelief. But, hey, we believe God. So he can do great works in our lives if we believe in our lives if we believe God. So I call a quote to your memory which we would probably not agree with Edward Everett Hale on very much, but I really like this quote when it applies to our lives as Christians. He said, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something, and I will not let what I cannot do, therefore, interfere with what I can do. We may just be ordinary people. But God can use ordinary people to change the course of history. Jael could have sat there and done nothing, but she chose to do what she could. I think God respects those who do what they can. In fact, I call to remembrance. Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. They took up offerings different than we do. Rather than passing the plate, <coughs> it's kind of like what you described from your home church growing up. There's a box, and people came forth and put their money in the box. And wherever Jesus said, he could actually see what they were putting in the box. And everybody's casting their money into the box. There came certain poor widow. Now let's back up. Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a poor widow. She threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast, in, cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she of her want, that means of her needs, did cast in all that she had, even her living. So he called this poor widow woman who only gave a couple of pennies, Michael, but because that was all she had, that was all she could do, Jesus said she did more than everybody else. And then in, in Mark 14, a girl has come in and broken an alabaster box full of ointment and spread it on his feet. 
took her hair and washed his feet in it. We used some essential oils at our house and the boys complained because you use just a little and the smell fills the house. And here she, she took a year's wage worth of some precious ointment and is washing his. So I know the smell filled the house. And Judas complained and said, we could have sold this for 300 penny worth. That was a year's wage and could have given it to the poor. Jesus answered, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do good to them. But me ye have not always. Here's the phrase I want you to remember. She hath done what she could. She is come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. A Holy Spirit's question to each of us this morning is, are you doing what you could? Could means the ability is there. Could means the opportunity is there. Are we taking advantages, advantage spiritually to the opportunities God has given us? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege.